Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see all of you here this morning. I'm getting old, you know that? So, yes, I was asking, I was going to see if anyone would say, how old are you? Well, I'll tell you this, my six-year-old granddaughter, I've got two granddaughters, one of them's six. She, was, she stays at our house every once in a while, as grandkids do, you know, and and anyway, she was at her house, and she came in, and the TV set was on, and there was a Western on. And she goes, Papa watches these. <laughs> but his don't have any color. <laughs> I watch the old Western, black and white, gun smoke, all that. And yeah, and, and his, his doesn't have any color. And then she goes, blah. That's me. I am blah to the very end. All right? Amen. Yeah. Well, that's apparently how old I am. I can't wait till she gets a little older and we can watch Pale Rider and Outlaw Josie Wales. She'll love those then, right? Probably no. Blah again. Why don't you have a seat, guys? Thank you again for being with us today. I have quite a few things happening. Um, we're starting a new Sunday school class for like college age. It's 18 to like 26. Um, Barry's going to be doing that. Barry Sanborn's going to be starting that. And that's um, this month. Well, next month actually, but it's, uh, uh, August 21st we'll be starting that class. Okay, and so um, love for you to be there. Um, and uh, starting this brand new class, he'll be trying to get a hold of people. But if you know of someone, let us know. Um, judo is starting again Tuesday, August 9th. We do kids' classes, then we have teen and adult class, and it's all geared towards self defense. With kids, it teaches a lot about discipline, um, it teaches self esteem and that sort of thing, and how to, how to not have bullies ruin your life. As an adult, we teach you more self defense. Um, and so I'd love for you to come. I'm one of the senseis, um, and I'd love for you to come and be a part of that. If you want to learn some self-defense but have fun, meet some friends, and also get some exercise, this is perfect. So anyway, let me know if you're interested. Of course, you know I'm on Facebook. Send me a message or something. I'll give you all the details for either children's classes or the older class. We also have uh, baptisms down at the creek. Woohoo! Yep, another one. September the 18th, so that would be the last time for the year that I know of. I once had to go out in the middle of November and baptize someone. But as far as I know, this will be the last baptism for the year, um, September 18th down at Shoal Creek. Let me know or one of the other pastors uh, know if you're going to be wanting to be baptized. Uh, we need to pick up all the chairs. We've got a big event here this week, so you guys that help pick up chairs all the time, um, we need to put them all, all away. One last thing for me is, uh, Daniel, where are you at, Daniel? Stand up. See his T-shirt? <laughs> Daniel is very active in the church. He helps with Paul's Kitchen. He actually was the head cook for one year. And uh, he goes to kayak camp, and he's the head cook there. He is in Newton County presiding commissioner candidate and there's five people running for this position my friends I mean it could come down to 10 votes literally and so if you live in Newton County I, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you to vote for him but I can say he's a great guy he'll be great in uh, in office as presiding commissioner of Newton County so if you're in Newton County you know who to vote for. Talk to your friends, talk to your relatives if they live in Newton County. Even you guys in Jasper County can call some of your Newton County family or friends and say, hey, here's, here's, here's a guy you ought to look at for voting for presiding judge. And that is August the 9th. I mean, sorry, no, August the 2nd, this Tuesday. I, I got the wrong one. August 2nd, which is Tuesday. This Tuesday you can go and vote anyone in Newton County. All right. I kind of messed that up. <laughs> so, all right. And that's coming up August the 2nd. That's this Tuesday, you know. 
You got Ron a nice vote. I understand my neighbors are going to vote for you too, Ty and Aaron. So there's four votes, maybe all you need. Oh, you got six votes now. You're, you and your wife. You're not sure your wife's voting for you. All right. Precincts too, so everyone else does. Yeah, why not? No, you can't do that. I'm not dead yet. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have some news about the the staff here at the church. We uh, Brandon Martin, who has been our youth minister for the last uh, five years, is leaving to go back to work at the school district. And we are sorry to see him go. He's going to be working at the Joplin School District. Uh, so we wish him well. We, Like I said, we're sorry to see him go. Uh, and the reason he's not here this morning, he's on vacation. So, <laughs> um, But as sorry as we are to see Brandon go, we are excited because Logan Johns, who has been our middle school youth minister for, I haven't even asked you how long. How long have you been? It feels like 20 years, but five years? Okay. Uh, Logan is going to take over. She is going to be the youth director now. And, you know, a lot of times when we have issues like this come up with, with uh, staff transition, we get somebody new that has really no idea what's been going on in a certain ministry. But Logan has been there for five years, and she has already started kind of uh, moving towards being the person in charge and leading the youth group and, and the youth ministry here. So we are really excited to have her here doing that. And with this being her first week full-time, she has her first official announcement. Good morning. You guys are so much more exciting than the Wednesday night service. There was someone who was really rude, who was like booing and hissing me off stage. Security had to take them out. I know, it was my sister. <laughs> not that one, it was the other one. She's not here. Um, <laughs> so uh, like Ty said, we are so sad to see Brandon go, but we're also really excited to see what the Lord does in his life in this next season. Uh, having spiritually vibrant Christian leaders in the school is so important. Uh, he's also going to be at the school that we do one of our Bible clubs at. So it's going to be super awesome. The kids are going to get to see him there. Uh, and we're just really thankful for the ministry that he has been doing here for the last several years. And we're also really excited uh, just for the direction that the Lord is leading us in this next season. So with that, I hate to be a party pooper, uh, but summer is coming to an end and school is approaching I know my mother is a teacher. She's over there giving me the stink eye. But school is approaching. And with that, we are going to switch back to Sunday Youth on Sunday, August 21st. And in order to make Sunday Youth effectively happen, we need 10 to 15 adults who are willing to regularly volunteer with us um, and to pour in and invest in our students. So any given Sunday, we can have anywhere from like 30 to 50 kids and we want to be able to adequately meet the needs of our students and so we need to have a good number of adults to be there and partner with us. So here on the screen if you guys are interested in volunteering with us if maybe you have questions about the ministry and you're not entirely sure if you would 100% commit now to volunteering or if you know someone who should be volunteering, open up your camera and hover over this QR code. It's going to pull up a link where you can fill out a little document that will have your name, your information, your contact info, so we can contact each other, um, get coffee or ice cream, whatever. Uh, and I would love to talk to you about the direction that we're going in and the things that the students have planned for this upcoming year. We are very much a ministry that is running off of what our students want and the direction that the Lord is leading them. And so I am so excited for the things that they have planned this upcoming year. Even if you do not have a student in youth ministry, even if you've never volunteered with us before, or even if you think that you're too old, you're not. Um, we 
really are desiring and seeking spiritually vibrant adults who are willing to pour in and invest in our students. When we were in Colorado a couple of weeks ago, they gave us a statistic that absolutely wrecked my world. And it was that there are approximately one million teenagers from the church, Christian teens, each year who are deciding to leave the church. And so that's not teens who are just deciding not to enter the church. That's not one million teens who are deciding like, oh, a relationship with Jesus is not the relationship for me, so I'm not going to attend. Those are teens who were involved in their local church who are actively making the decision to leave. And I think that having adults who are investing in them and pouring into them is a huge part in keeping our students here. If we don't invest in our students now, we're gonna have a very empty room in five to 10 years. Uh, so it is also a biblical example, a biblical model uh, for older generations to mentor and pour into younger generations. And we're very blessed here at Christ Community to have a diverse age range of members in our congregation. So I ask that this school year you partner in praying with us uh, over this transition in ministry, but I also ask that you pray with us about whether you volunteer, scan the QR code, um, or meet me in the back after service. Um, or like I said, if you know someone who should volunteer with us, or maybe you think that they would be someone who would be great for pouring into the lives of our teens, please encourage them to pray about it and then talk with me because we would love to have you guys. And if you don't come to me, I'm going to track you down. And I'll find you. Thank you. <laughs> so far in all three services, I've scanned that and just signed people up, too. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward now and receive our tithes and offerings. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, we ask that you let the offering plate pass you by. Uh, we're glad to have you here as our guest. But for those of us that call this church home, this is our chance to worship the Lord with our giving. God, we thank you for all of the ways that you bless and enrich our lives. We ask now that you would receive these tithes and offerings and use them to build your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Today a man is somewhere proclaiming the good news, winning families to Jesus all around his neighborhood. He tells them that God is able to make their house a home. He wants to win his world for Christ, but he can't do it alone. Thanks, Carol. 
In our prayers today, we have a couple of people um, to pray. Jack Pennington um, attends our Saturday night service, and uh, he's in the hospital right now um, fighting infection and such. So prayers for Jack, and I talked to Sue the other day. And uh, then Shirley Mutz, who usually attends early service, they're on vacation down in Florida. She tripped and fell and broke three ribs. And so I talked to, to Jess, her husband, um, yesterday and uh, was telling about it and everything. She was in the hospital for a bit. But anyway, he wanted us to pray for her because she's in a lot of pain. They did give her some pain meds. She's out. Um, he's on the beach in Florida. He says, but it's hot down here. I said, well, it's 72 here. And it really was. It was 72 degrees. I didn't tell him it was raining. But 72 here. And he goes, oh. But uh, anyway, he has rented her a, uh, and I may be watching online, I don't know. But uh, he has rented her one of those uh, uh, wheelchairs with the motor that has the big balloon tires for going in the sand. So who knows? She may be just flying through the spray of the ocean right now, just powering it up all the way down. I don't know. But uh, those are the folks we want to pray for today that I know about. And so um, Ty's going to lead us in our prayer time today. God, we always thank you for meeting us here. Every week we know that when we walk through the doors that you're here waiting for us. And God, for so many of us, it's like coming home every weekend. It's something that we look forward to. And God, we know that the reason that we feel that way about this place is because you're at the center of everything that we do. We always seek your will and your guidance in everything that we do. And when we change our lives to fit with your pattern, then we're never disappointed. And God, that's why this has become such a special place to so many of us. And this morning, we lift up Jack and Shirley and ask that even though they can't be here, that you would bless them in the same way. And God, for so many other people that can't be here for so many different reasons, that are missing being here because of ailments and injuries and so many other different things that keep us away god we ask that you would bless them in the same way that you bless us here this morning and god we ask that you would continue to use this congregation these people that call this building home as your instrument in the world that we live in to go and and share your good news and God, we ask that you would watch over the youth ministry and the transition that's taking place. And God, we thank you for providing us with people that have answered your call. And I ask that you would use every person that's here to go and do your work, even if it's some place that we don't want to go. God, there's a lot of times that you call us to go places and do things and, and we're not sure if that's what we want to do, but we're never disappointed when we do the work that you give us to do. And God, we know that you've given that work to every one of us, whether we're paid to be on staff at the church or we're just sitting here for the first time this morning, that you've called all of us to be in ministry and to go and share your good news. So, God, I ask that you would give us opportunity to do that and that you would give us the courage and the ability to share that good news with people that desperately need it. And that you would continue to use this church to change the lives of people that come into contact with it. And God, now as we continue our service here this morning, we ask that your Spirit would not only give us rest from the things that we've been doing this week, from the work that we do for you and for all the troubles that the world gives us, but that you would also anoint us to worship you with everything that we do and that the songs that we're about to sing would bring us closer to you and that you would speak through your messenger directly to our hearts this morning. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now let us lift our voices and stand as we sing to the mighty God, Jehovah.
Father God, there is none like you today, Lord. We worship you with our heart, with our songs, with our praise today, Lord. Now we worship you with your word spoken. Speak mightily through your messenger. May we hear, may we receive, and may we go out and preach your gospel. In your name we pray, amen. All you history students want to learn some more history? Thank you. Saturday, I had to make them say something because they were like, no. Well, I love history, as you know. I love to study it. But it's more than that because I think about the people that were living during that time. You know, think about it. During the Depression, how people got along and through it. And during battles and wars and... Anyway, but I, I love Methodist history, too, because some of my heroes in ministry were those old folks that long ago brought the Word to a very needy people. And they preached the Gospel, and they, and they, they endured hardship after hardship and such. Um, here's a, here's a, a statue of uh, Francis Asbury. Someone gave that to me years ago, and it's been uh, one of my possessions. It's, it's really cool. It's uh, um, him traveling, and, and they, they added up how many miles they thought he went. It's like a quarter million miles, all on horse or in a buggy. That's a lot. And uh, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, and, and what he did and, and how he would go about it. Um, Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright was an old circuit rider, and... Uh, Oh, there, there, there's Peter. His, his hair is pretty good, though. He was known for his hair. His hair would get real long. Of course, these guys would circuit ride, and they'd go be gone for two weeks or maybe a month at a time, and they'd come back around. Anyway, he was known for his real wild hair and his fiery preaching. He wasn't well-trained, but boy, he could bring the Word to people, and thousands of people came to Christ. He's also my hero because uh, whenever he would go out and he'd preach, and he'd preach anywhere, an old farm place, a barn, he would be up on a, on a wagon perhaps, and uh, they would always have hecklers because it was open air and some, some young bucks would get too much drink in them or whatever and then come up and try to heckle him. Not everyone was a follower of Jesus during that time on the pioneer days. And so they would heckle him while he's preaching. He would leap off the wagon and start And he says quite a few people came to Jesus because of that. <laughs> and, and just before you ever heckle me, just know he is one of my heroes. <laughs> I'll bring them rascals to Jesus too. Judo chop, you know. John Wesley when he began his ministry, and, and remember he had a time in his life, he was already an a, a Anglican priest, but he had a time when the Holy Spirit got hold of his heart, and he says, my heart was strangely warmed, and he knew for the first time in his life that Jesus died for him. Before that, he always thought, well, through actions and stuff, you could go to heaven. He knew right then that it was about Jesus. And then when it changed him, changed the way he preached, the way he did things, and he began to preach everywhere. He, he, um, we have some pictures of him. Um, here he is, and uh, one thing about him, that as, you know, this is when he's a little bit older, by this time he's like a celebrity and people wanted to come out and hear him. But he would preach outdoors wherever he could, mainly because the doors of the um, Anglican churches were closed to him. He was an Anglican priest, but he couldn't come into a church because the priest a lot of times wouldn't allow him because he preached differently. He preached with excitement. Most Anglicans would have a, a sermon written out, and page by page he would turn it. Page by page he would talk in monotone. You ever been to a church like that? Yeah. <laughs> 
I have, where the pastor just reads the message. I was like, give me, give me the manuscript and let me read it in my own time. Save me 25 minutes or whatever. But it was all monotone. Everyone was asleep. It was dead. That's how the Anglican churches were. And John Wesley, like, it's not supposed to be that way. Not to mention, most Anglican churches, and I've shared this with you before, most Anglican churches had the rich and maybe the upper middle class in there, but the poor people weren't even welcome. They weren't wanted. And so the poor people didn't have Christ in their life. They never went to church and that sort of thing. And John Wesley said, every soul, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or educated or not, every soul was worth great things to God. If you're sitting here thinking, well, I'm worthless or I'm not good enough to serve God, you are so wrong because God values you. And he wants to reconnect with you. Your soul is worth it to God. And so John Wesley would go out and preach. Here he's preaching in a, in a, in a square, town square. That's why they had that cross. And back, back up a little bit, you'll see um, some people are dressed okay. This guy over here and his tri hat and everything. But several people you can see here are poor. And they might be hearing the gospel for the first time because John Wesley would go out in a cow pasture. He would, start, he would have it in a barn. He, he would have services anywhere he could, standing on a stump. Um, when coal miners got off work, they, they, you know, they'd work 12, 14 hours, and they'd come out, and they're all just blackened and everything, and he would preach to them, and tears would stream down their faces and wipe off the coal dust on their face. In fact, John Wesley said that he set himself on fire and people would come to watch him burn. And that's his preaching. He was such a different preacher. Now, you can read his messages. Um, there's a book out. It's 52 Wesleyan sermons of John Wesley sermons. You can buy it on Amazon or wherever you buy books. Um, and, and if you read the messages, the sermons, um, Theologically, they're perfect. Biblically, they're perfect. But it doesn't, it, it, they're not thrilling. But the thrilling part came in two ways. One, his preaching. And two, the Holy Spirit bringing about a change in the people as they heard the message. And uh, here, here's uh, him preaching just wherever he could preach. One of the other pictures shows him he was supposed to, here, this is the first night where he was supposed to preach to the people in the church. And he arrived at the church, and they had locked him out of the church, the priest did. So he said, okay. He went to the graveyard next to the church, and he got up on, that's the, uh, that's the, um, Bur uh, bur the uh, place that they placed his dad his dad was buried there and they built up a little thing put a stone on top and he wanted to preach so he stood up on his father's grave and his father was an anglican preacher too by the way but he got up and he preached there so he could be up amongst everyone and you, it's kind of interesting this painting you see the dog someone brought their dog you see the two kids over here playing. They're not listening really to the message. But, every, but look at the people listening to the message and him preaching. And this was the first night. And the story goes with this one that he preached one, one day. And this said, they, people said, can you come back tomorrow night? We want to hear you preach again. So he said, okay. I mean, I don't often get, no one ever tells me, hey, come back tomorrow and preach too. But they asked him to come back. So he came back. And even more people were there. And then they said, please, please, come back and preach tomorrow too. So he came back and even more and more people were gathered. And basically he had a revival in that town. And uh, people's souls were saved. Amen. So, and here he is. I, I, don't, I think this is a barn that he's preaching in. Oftentimes he preached in a barn. One time he preached in a barn. So many people were in the loft. The loft gave out and collapsed underneath everyone. That would be exciting. You could say, well, something interesting happened at church today. Um, but uh, he, he would preach to these folks. And uh, you see his collar um, 
from the 1700s that would show that he was a preacher they had magistrates would oftentimes use a collar similar to that when you say a man of the cloth representing a clergy that's what they were talking about this cloth that they wore around their neck okay i actually have one with an old suit um, that he would preach and my friends he told his preachers he told his preachers, you ha and some of them were lay folks. We, in fact, we've sent some lay preachers out from this church to go into the world and preach. But he told his preachers, you have nothing to do but to save souls. Nothing to do but to save souls. Now that's for preachers, but I suspect that was kind of for everyone that was Methodist tradition. You have nothing to do but to save souls. Grab your bulletin. See the painting? I asked Tara to put this painting uh, in your bulletins. This is John Wesley. And he's about to send, this is Thomas Koch, the guy in the nice hat and everything. This was Thomas Koch. He was one of the first bishops of the Methodist Church along with Asbury. Thomas Koch didn't do a lot. Um, he was a good administrator, but um, since he was from Great Britain, he, 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 he didn't do so well in, in the colonies. But uh, anyway, this is John Wesley, and we know from history when they were getting ready to shove off, and he was getting on one of the sailing ships in the background there. That's a cool painting. <clears throat> and we know from history with Thomas, Thomas Coke. He said, offer them Christ, Thomas. Offer them Christ as they pushed away. Offer them Christ. Every Sunday, I feel this is what I do. I offer Christ. I want people to know Christ. I want people to understand about how much God loves them and how much they need a Savior. And so offer them Christ. And this is the name of the painting. Offer them Christ. And I believe we are called to do that as well, my friends. It is our responsibility to share, to witness, to, to teach, to invite, to make sure everyone understands that they need a Savior. And then through the Holy Spirit, they begin to understand, their lives begin to change. Offer them Christ. We all have people that we know that we could offer Christ to. Do we? Let's get into the Scripture. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus hears about John the Baptist being thrown in jail. Now soon John the Baptist will be beheaded. Um, the king of that area, King Herod, wanted, wanted him gone, so he beheaded him. But when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in jail, he knew it was time for him to begin his official ministry. In fact, he hadn't even called disciples yet. That's in the next section of Scripture. And so he, said, he basically knows that it's time. Because John the Baptist had even said, I must become less, he must become more, speaking of Jesus. And so Jesus knows it's time. Now that he's been placed in jail, it is officially time to launch his ministry. And here it says this in verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. We know a little bit about what he preached and how he, he talked. But here in this says the theme. This will set the table for everything Jesus says in the coming pages in Matthew. Here is the theme of what Jesus would preach. Repent. Change things. Get your life changed and right, is what he's saying. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
The kingdom of heaven has come near. And I would say it's for us today, repent and know that the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he begins to call his disciples. In John, we see a little bit of what Jesus was saying. Um, And this is John 3.16. Most of you all know it, right? For God so loved the world, you, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Guys, if you do not have Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you're not moving in in step with him, and you're not living your life for him, you're in peril. You're in danger. And I'm offering you a way out. I'm offering you Christ. It's almost people like people speeding down the road and someone says, bridge out, bridge out. And they would go on past because they know better than the guy with the sign saying, bridge is out, be careful, it's dangerous. We all know John 3.16, but it continues. People don't ever add that back in. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's truly as clear as I can make it. And it's not my words, it's the words of Jesus. There is one way to salvation. One way. In the early church, people brought their friends and their family and everyone uh, to worship. There was excitement. In the early church, it grew so fast. In fact, it says in Acts 2, It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Wow. Well, that meant every day? You mean people came to Christ every day? Yes. And it's supposed to be that way now. The Holy Spirit was working, but also people were excited about their faith. People were excited about their community of faith, which was the church. And people were out talking and sharing and inviting. We've lost some of that. Haven't we? I want everyone to go to heaven. I guess that's why I preach and I offer Christ every week in hopes that people will receive Christ. The early Methodist movement was very much like this. And churches were being born. Circuit riders were going out everywhere. I'm I'm still considered a traveling elder. I'm just attached to you all so I don't travel much. But I'm in the long line of those old circuit riders. And they would go out and they would preach the Word. And people would respond. This was an article in in a magazine. Um, And this, uh, he's, he's a Lutheran pastor. He said, those of us who are called to ordain ministry in the church are not surprised by the decline of America's religious culture. Most of, and I've, I've talked about it a little bit. All the polls show that people aren't going to church as much anymore. Um, and it's sad because the people that aren't attending church they're raising their kids. I think it'd be scary to try to raise people without the church nowadays. All the morals and, and such it helps with. And I just think it'd be scary to raise kids. But they are so busy. They are so busy. They don't have time. And so the kids are raising themselves in a culture that may not be quite as moral as it could be. They don't have that support of a church. They don't have those constant teachings about um, how Christ loves us. And so we have generations coming up now that haven't been raised in church, and nor that sometimes they do get back into church, but a lot of times they don't. 
He goes on, he writes, For 20 years we have watched more and more of our neighbors involved in activities other than worship on Sunday mornings. Shopping at Walmart, ferrying children to sports events, or just sleeping in. I'd add, I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make people upset, but I'd add in traveling teams. I had one event that someone was said they had to go to, and it was on a Sunday morning. And I said, why, why are you having it on a Sunday morning? And they looked at me and they said, well, everyone's busy on a Saturday. And I did. I, I, just, I just did this because it was giving me a headache. So you don't have things on Saturdays because everyone's busy. Oh, Sundays, no one's busy. Are you kidding me? I remember in a day on Sundays, everything was pretty much closed up, and the Sunday was for worship and family. And now it's just another day for commerce, another day to do stuff. I have teams that play ball on Sunday morning. Teams that have practices on Sunday morning. Why? Well, no one's doing anything on Sunday morning. And he, I'm, I'm here. Even church people will say, oh, you're having practice on Sunday morning? Okay, coach, we'll be there. And I'd say, well, you can have your practice, but I won't be there, neither will my kids, because as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. It's serious stuff. You can put your kids in all kinds of activities, but if they don't know Christ when they're an adult, I'll let you figure out what I'm thinking. The statistics back up what clergy have been seeing firsthand for two decades. But what is also true about the American church is that there are still many families and individuals who are committed they still manage to make it to worship on, sun, on most Sunday mornings. They juggle their schedules so their kids can attend Sunday school and youth group meetings while still playing sports and taking violin lessons. They make, you know, the churches make quilts for Africa, build homes for Habitat for Humanity. We built two or three homes over the years. They serve in local soup kitchens or food banks. They spend their own money on going on mission trips. And he kind of goes on. Um, our our uh, wheelchair ramp team put up a wheelchair ramp in the rain yesterday morning. And so, yes, our church is out there doing stuff. We have a lot of great and committed people in this church, and I'm proud of it. We do all kinds of stuff, and we never get any fanfare. In fact, he says this. They give of their time, talent, and treasure in so many ways, and they make a positive and lasting impact. In my little corner of the world, Christians of all denominations are of ones who are leading these important efforts. They do with little fanfare. You know, we don't call the news every time we do something. Some churches do. They want, they want credit for everything. But I'm of opinion, why are we doing it? Is it so everyone goes, oh, look at that church. Wow, what, what great job. Or are we doing it to bless others? That's just my thought. From what I observe in my community, there isn't some great theological or philosophical dilemma among the unchurched. There are just, as, just many who are so self-absorbed that they haven't given much thought to what is truly important and lasting for their children, much less for their communities and their world. What a shame that there are so many opportunities for service in our Lord's name and that so few make it a priority that was interesting kind of what i had been thinking for a long time but people are reached for jesus there are so many stories out there and people's lives are changed and we could have testimonies from people in this church of how their lives have been changed since they met christ I had this story here um a, a, a preacher who preached at the university church just off the campus of uh, Toledo University. And uh, he happened to be in the science wing where he felt quite comfortable. 
and he was talking to some folks there, and one of his kids that he kind of dealt with at his church, and then he went to the school there, this kid came along and looked at a big plaque on the wall of this science building. And it said, Dr. Julian Davies, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and medical, uh, Medicinal Chemistry. So, big chemist. He had won all kinds of awards when he started out. Um, he he uh, had uh, secured a great future. He, even as young as he was, he, he received a full professorship and was noted all over the world for his uh, chemistry abilities. And this big plaque was to note him. And this kid, this college kid, turned to his preacher and said, Wow! Look! There's a guy here with the same name as you! And Reverend Davies, he smiled and said, yeah, that's a real coincidence. He, the preacher, was the same man who was the professor of chemistry. You see, he tells a story about how he was raised an atheist. I, I think he, uh, he said he was a lifelong and rather smug atheist. He said, my parents and the rest of my family, we grew up entirely outside the life of the church. I had literally never been inside a church other than maybe a wedding or two all the way through my adult life. Boy, that's, that's, that's the truth nowadays. Some people only come to church for weddings and occasionally for a funeral. They don't even come Easter. They don't even come Christmas Eve. They just don't go. They're not people of faith, they're agnostic, they're atheist, or sometimes they're just lazy believers. He said, so I was an atheist, and actually a pretty serious atheist, not just a general run-of-the-mill atheist, he was a serious atheist. I quite enjoyed baiting Christians about their faith. So he was trying to tear down people's faith. But then a change happened in him. And it's a long story. But he found Christ. And everything changed. Then God called him into ministry away from teaching chemistry. And so he went to a seminary. In fact, he went to the seminary I came from. He went to Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. And now he's a preacher and he was a preacher at that church right across the way from where he used to preach or teach chemistry in that university. You see, God makes changes. God is in the change business. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or what you've done. God makes a difference. Amen? Peter. The Apostle Peter in the book of Acts, he said this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which, by which we might be saved. There is no other way. That's what Peter says. That's what Jesus says. There is no other way except through Jesus Christ that anyone can be saved. Are you a good person? but it's not going to get you saved are you a kind person fantastic but it's not going to get you saved only through jesus christ will you be saved here's an old question old methodist question sometimes i use it I have a question for you today. How is your soul? How is your soul? And then we have a world that's hurting, and do we care? Or do we care about southwest Missouri, or maybe your county, or your town you're from, or the places you go, or the places you work? 
maybe even your own family, do you care? Jesus said this, and this is what I'm going to end on. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. My friends, the harvest is bountiful out there. I know on the farm, if you didn't put your grain up in time, the rains would come and it would waste and it would mildew and it would be of no use. The harvest is out there. How many of us have spent time inviting people, talking to people, sharing our, our story with people? Share the good news with everyone you meet. In fact, I would say this. Offer them Christ. Amen? I know there's a couple wanting to join the church today. They've been attending for some time. And um, as we have the closing song, I, wa I want to invite uh, them to come forward. And you can meet them, and they're wanting to come and be a part of our church this morning. Will you please stand? This is Tom and Pat Noble, and they're joining us from another church in the area, but they've been coming and been so excited uh, to be able to be here at the church. Some of you might have met them. And uh, Pat wanted to re be reaffirmed down at the creek last, last Sunday. So I took her down, held her under for a long time. <laughs> Tom said it wasn't near long enough. I've only had her for 68 years, so I... 68 years. Still on probation. Oh, and he's still on probation, she said. <laughs> I have some questions for you as you join the church. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Will you continue to grow in the life of grace? Seek God's will in your life. Work as a servant, caring, sharing with others. Will you support this church and ministry by giving of your time, talents, service, gifts, and prayers? All right. Welcome into the church, and we'll, we'll go back there. I want to say hi to you, and then we want to take your picture, too. So go, go ahead and head them back. You can have one. Guys, um, it, it's great to have them into the church. I've been talking for the, uh, them with them some time. Um, if you would ever want to make that commitment of faith, let me know. Love to have you as part, official part of Christ's community. It's a pretty great church. Amen. Amen. We well, receive the benediction. Jesus tells us to go and make this, and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and share with them all that I've given you. Amen. <laughs>